you know, defining terroir is important, so we go through a quick uh, definition. I will select a couple of major factors. There's so many factors involved in terroir that you have to make a hierarchy, and I will select a few, show how we can measure them, and then how to manage them. I think terroir really can be managed, and my talk will be very much about managing um, terroir. So, um, for terroir, there are many scientists coming from different disciplines who worked on terroir. A geologist, and this is a very nice book on terroir by Wilson, but in fact, this book is not about terroir. It's about the geology of wine growing regions. So, the only thing which is wrong with this book is the title. <laughs> Geo Geomorphologists have worked on terroir, soil scientists have made very nice soil maps. Climatologists have been working out data and making maps. Some people got also interested in soil microbiology. But the point is that all these approaches remain pretty descriptive. They don't explain terroir. And the reason is they forgot the most important thing, which is the vine. And it's important to put the vine in the middle of the terroir. And a couple of years ago, I assisted to a conference by a New Zealand geographer, Warren Moran, and he was talking about this topic, and, and he had a very nice statement. And he looked at all the people in the room, those geologists and pedologists, and he said, we are all victims of our own discipline. And I wanted to share the statement with you, because I think there's a lot of truth in that. Um, so the definition of terroir, well, terroir can be considered as an ecosystem. And I like to consider it as an ecosystem because then you put the, the living organism, in our case the vine, in the middle of that ecosystem. And of course there are also environmental factors like climate with temperature, water, radiation, and CO2. The soil brings water and, and nutrients, in particular nitrogen, to the vine. So these environmental factors are interacting with, with the vine. And the growers can act on that ecosystem with the choice of the plant material, the viticultural techniques, and all these interactions. Interactions is, are very important in terroir expression. will give a certain grape composition, and only once the grapes are turned into wine through vinification, adapted aging, then you can talk about terroir and quality and typicity uh, which is brought by the terroir. Um, in my talk I focus on, on some major um, parameters involved in terroir expression, temperature, water and uh, nutrients, in particular nitrogen, and see how um, terroir impacts on these parameters and how they can be managed by the growers. So air temperature is clearly a very important uh, terroir uh, parameter, and temperatures are highly variable, not only among wine-growing regions, but also inside wine-growing regions. And one of the first times that it clearly has been shown was during the PhD thesis from Benjamin Bois. He showed that inside the Bordeaux area, uh, mean temperatures during the growing season can be as var var variable as by 1.5 degrees centigrade, which is very important. And of course, these differences in temperature will have a major impact in, in, fine, um, in, in, the, in the possibilities to bring your grapes to full ripeness and also in the timing of phenology. The phenology is very much driven by air temperatures. Soil temperature also has uh, some importance. Um, you can grow vines either on warm soil, so for instance gravelly soils are warm soils because there's little water in the soil, but also shallow soils are warm soils because what matters is the temperature in the root zone and in shallow soils the roots are of course close to the surface. So we can consider stony soils and shallow soils as warm soils. On the other hand, you, you can have, on the other side you can have cool soils, deep loamy soils are cool soils or soils with problems with water logging. Vine water status is a very, another important terroir factor which has been shown by, by many authors. And um, it's a sort of composite parameter because it depends on the soil, on the one hand on the soil water holding capacity, and on the other hand on climatic parameters. And, and you can very clearly see the influence of the soil and the climate on the water status of the vines when you do uh, soil water balance uh, modeling. And so the, on the, the result depends both on the soil water holding capacity and on climatic uh, parameters. The vines pick up nutrients from the soil and among all the nutrients the vines pick up from the soil it's clear that nitrogen has the biggest impact on vine growth, vine vigor, yield and, and grape composition. Um, 
Vine nitrogen varies with the soil type depending on the type of organic, the amount of organic material and also the turnover of the organic material. Climate has some impact in the, on that turnover from one year to the other. The availability of nitrogen can differ and of course management practices like fertilization and uh, floor management also have an impact on vine nitrogen. For instance in this picture you can see how variable nitrogen can be in a vineyard block here for instance low nitrogen yellow vines and this often happens because when, when the soil is moved before the plantation you have to be very careful not to destroy the terroir by moving uh, the soil now these major uh, terroir parameters can quite easily be measured today and there's been a lot of progress over the past years in the measurement of these terroir parameters people have been mapping vineyard soils for ages at a very fine resolution but the precision of the maps have been largely increased by the use of, um, uh, the, of the measurement of soil resistivity. And you can see an example if you do the measurement of soil resistivity before making a soil map, but you'll actually not replace the actual uh, soil mapping with auger holes and soil pits, but you can reduce the number of observations and also your the limits of your zones become so much more precise when you do it after measurement of um, soil electricity connectivity. Um, much more recently there have been significant um, um, progress in temperature mapping at, at vineyard scale. Uh, we used to have one weather station at least in the main wine growing regions and then um, automatic stations have been developed, we got more and more and today uh, we also have these very nice very small weather stations with uh, temperature loggers inside. Now if you and these are very cheap, so you can put plenty of these small weather stations in the vineyard. And if you combine this information with information from a digital elevation map, you can make temperature maps. Uh, this is an example which Lord Resigier, my colleague Lord Resigier showed on Monday. Very precise temperature mapping in the centimeter and Pomerol area. And to, so that means that today we can map temperatures um, at a scale which is completely the same as the high resolution soil maps. So that's, that's very nice to have that assessment. Phenology can very accurately be uh, modeled and um, with one of my PhD students, Amber Parker, we've uh, developed um, uh, a phenology model which works very nice for flowering and veraison. It's called the GFV, Grapevine Flowering Veraison Model. And then in a subsequent paper we uh, um, published a classification for the timing of flowering and veraison for, here's just an, an example, but we've classified over a hundred varieties for the timing of flowering and veraison with this um, with this model and we're actually working on uh, currently working on a sugar model um, a sugar ripeness model uh, based on the same principle to predict sugar ripeness for a wide range of uh, varieties so you can combine the temperature data with phenology models to know the timing of your ripeness Vine water, vine water state is an important terroir factor and uh, I'm a great believer in plant-based measurements. I, I, I believe that you can much better assess the water states of the vines directly on the plant, in particular in vines where the rooting can be so deep. If the, if the roots are under one meter in depth, it's very difficult to get a precise assessment with soil-based measurements. Now, the, for me, the ultimate tool remains the, the pressure bomb to, re, to measure fine water status, in particular when you're doing either pre-dawn or stem water potential readings, and you get at those very nice curves, precise curves over the season to see how the water status of the vines develop. Of course, these tools are constraining because they cannot be uh, automated. That's one of the limits. And and that's why we have developed another method which is based on the discrimination of the carbon-13 isotope in grape sugar. Well, I have no time to go into details, but basically the amount of carbon-13 which is incorporated in grape sugar increases with the level of water stress. So if you take a sample, just a sample of grape juice at the end of the season and you send it to a specialized lab, you can know how much water stress the vines faced during grape ripening. And so basically for the grower, you just have to sample your grape juice and send it to a lab. It's, it's very affordable, it's less than, than $50 for, um, for a measurement. So with this technique you can multiply the number of observations which you cannot do with a pressure bump. 
So for instance, this opens the possibility to map the water status of the vines over an estate. So here an example of a part of the vineyard from Chateau Chauvin Blanc in saint emilion And um, here we made a, a, a soil map. We first made a, a map of electric resistivity, and then we made a very precise soil map. And then we did um, a map of the water status of the vines with this 13C method with a quite um, uh, narrow sampling grid, 10 measurements per hectare. And then we get those very nice patterns of water deficit. This is the water deficit area. And it concords very well with the gravelly soils on the estate. And I think it's today the only technique which allows mapping vine water status at such a fine uh, scale. Now you can do the same thing with uh, the nitrogen status of the vine. If from the same sample that you ta take, you send um, a fraction of the grape juice to a lab who's doing 13C analysis and another part of the sample to a regular uh, enology lab and have the, the yeast available nitrogen measured, the yeast available nitrogen is a very good indicator of vine water status. So then you get these very nice intra-block variability of nitrogen status. Here parts of the vineyards which are low in nitrogen and other parts in the vineyard which are high in nitrogen. So we can map today the vine nitrogen status also at a very high resolution. So several factors are involved in terroir expression among these climate, soil, and, and these factors interact with plant material, training system, and vineyard floor management. And they can today be measured at a very fine resolution. All these factors, these major terroir factors, can be, can be mapped. And that, is, and, and that opens the possibility to very precisely manage your vineyard according to, to, to your variation in, in terroir. So how can you do that? So the third part of my talk is about the management of uh, terroir. Now, of course, the first point in management is the selection of the right uh, site for growing your grapes. What is very important in terroir expression is that the ripening of your grapes falls right in the middle of, um, of the ripening window, which on the Northern Hemisphere is about between the 10th of September and the 10th of October. If your grapes are not ripened by the 10th of October, then generally it will be very difficult to get them to full ripeness. And if they ripen too early in August, then um, your grapes will be uh, lacking acidity, your wines lacking freshness and aromatic complexity. So the timing of ripeness is critical in terroir expression. Now with the knowledge we have today on the variability of temperatures inside wine growing areas, we can very precisely fit the choice of the variety to local climatic uh, conditions. Or another uh, adaptation is to, uh, another um, uh, use of this is to adapt your management to climate change. For instance, this is work from Greg with Fernando Alves in the Douro Valley, and they've shown that in fact basically in the Douro Valley there's a big gradient from the river where it's very warm to upslope where it's cooler. So with climate change, the, the uh, vineyards can progressively migrate up the slope. So uh, the Douro region is very well prepared to climate change. And, and when I'm 90 years old, I think I can still enjoy very nice wines from the port region. Uh, so typically, um, uh, temperature can be managed through the variety choice. So to remain well, in fact, growers have always done that in, in most wine growing regions, that they have chosen varieties that are adapted to the local climate so that they ripen in the, right in the middle of that ripening window. And if people sometimes made mistakes, for instance, at one stage there was a lot of Chardonnay in, in the Napa Valley, which was clearly not adapted to the climate, it ripened too early, and they have abandoned it. So fortunately for, for us, the grapevine is probably the species with the biggest uh, phenologic variability. There's about 60 days from the most early ripening variety to the latest ripening variety. Uh, this is some preliminary work from Amber Parker on the sugar model ripeness. And you see that between a Pinot Noir and um, a Zinfandel or a Mouvedre, there's about 50 days time span in the timing of ripeness. So that gives a, a, a great possibilities to adapt the grapevine variety to local temperatures by planting early ripening varieties in cool climates and late ripening varieties in warm climates. The timing of ripeness so can be um, done by, the, by adapting the variety choice to the, to the air temperature, but also to the soil temperature. Um, on the 
quite smaller scale. And just give an example from the Bordeaux area where we grow several varieties, Merlot, Cabernet Franc, Cabernet Sauvignon for red wine. And there's quite a big difference between the timing of ripeness of Merlot and Cabernet Sauvignon. And Cabernet Sauvignon is a tricky variety for us because uh, it's right at the end of the ripening window. On average, Cabernet Sauvignon ripens between the 5th and the 10th of October. That means that in a cool vintage, we have a hard time getting Cabernet Sauvignon to full ripeness. So people plant Cabernet Sauvignon on warm soils. On warm soils in Bordeaux, you just get one week more precocity. And that means that on average, the Cabernet Sauvignon on a warm soil ripens the 1st of October. And that gives you a little bit more room in a cool vintage to bring it to full ripeness. Whereas on the cooler and deeper soils, we plant Merlot because Merlot is earlier. And even on a cool soil, in a cool vintage, you can bring it to full um, ripeness. Drought can also be an issue and will be more and more so with, with the changing climate. Um, and in fact, there are many possibilities to adapt uh, to, to a drier climate. Um, a very nice tool, which is completely environmental friendly, is the use of drought resistant rootstocks. And there are quite a bunch. And maybe we should develop even more drought resistant rootstocks. Also, the variety choice is very important. For instance, Grenache is a very drought resistant variety. And in, in uh, um, for instance, in, in, in Aragon, where it's very dry in Spain, this picture was taken at harvest time in an area where they have 350 millimeters of rain. And the Grenache just looks fine because it's a drought resistant variety and uh, it was grafted on 110R, which is a drought resistant rootstock. So, playing with the plant material, you can very well adapt to dry situations. And the training system is also important. You know, in the Mediterranean area, people have adapted since 2,000 years to dry climates by, by, by planting those vines at relatively low density and those nice Mediterranean bush vines. And they are incredibly resistant to, 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 to water stress. So. Um, it's also important in dry climates to choose soils with at least medium soil water holding capacity. It makes no sense in dry climates to plant vineyards on stony soils. So in a wet climate like Bordeaux, we would rather choose for growing high quality vines dry soils. And in dry climates, it's better to have soils with at least medium soil water holding capacity. Of course, irrigation is also an, an option, but with climate change, we are running out of water. So in my opinion, it makes sense to first uh, implement all the other options to resist to drought. And only once that has proven insufficient, then maybe in some particular situations, use irrigation. But I think it's not uh, reasonable to use irrigation as the first option to uh, resist to more drought, because there are plenty of other ways to adapt to drought. Nitrogen can also be very easily managed. Probably nitrogen is the most easy uh, terroir factor that can, be, that can be managed, either by adding fertilizer if nitrogen is too low, or by implementing cover crop is nitrogen if nitrogen is too high. So this is a trial where um, they just, this is the control, which was moderating nitrogen. And by fertilization, the yeast available nitrogen was easily brought up. And by putting cover crop, the yeast available nitrogen was put down. Down. So nitrogen is probably one of the terroir factors which can the most easily be uh, managed. So as a conclusion, I think it's very important to always keep the vine in the middle of our terroir. It's, it's all about these interactions. Terroir is all about the interactions between the, the vine and the local environment. And um, we should, this natural environment should be broken down in, in measurable factors. You know, you can measure uh, to quantify water, temperature, and light, but you cannot quantify soil type. Or it's important to, to bring it all down to things that you can measure and, and that you can map. And then make a hierarchy, because there are plenty of terroir factors. Of course, potassium probably also plays a role, and there are plenty of others. But it's important to make a hierarchy, because it's clear that some terroir factors are more important than others. Today, we have plenty of tools um, to measure and map major terroir factors. And this knowledge can be used to manage terroir. And in particular, management of terroir can be done through the choice of plant material. Very important to choose the right varieties and the right rootstocks in the right place and uh, management uh, strategies. And this allows maximizing terroir expression in a given site. Um,
um, just one slide to, uh, in particular for the growers here among you. Um, if you want to know more about terroir, we have developed in Bordeaux since a couple of years um, a terroir session uh, every year in the first week of March. Next year, from the 6th to the 10th March, we have um, a, a session in English about terroir and vineyard management with tastings and field trips. And since last year, Benjamin organized an, organized an extension in Burgundy. So if you want to have a good overview of uh, viticulture management in terroir, next year, hope to see you in Bordeaux and then with Benjamin in uh, Burgundy. Well, thank you very much.